Hey, everybody. I don't know when you are listening, but we are like November 1st, which means we are two days, three days away from one of the most cantankerous elections in the in United States history. We have a coronavirus going on that is gaining in numbers. We have race relationships around the world um, starting to take hold uh, and people are starting to say, I don't want to be treated like this. My voice matters. We have a woman's rights movement, which is Me Too, which is people saying, hey, you know what? I don't want to be treated that way anymore. That's not, that's not acceptable anymore. And we have a lot of our structures and our institutions crumbling around us, things that we put our faith in. We don't know now if we have news or fake news. We don't even know if our election process is, is, is intact or not intact. Some of our big corporations we used to believe in, we don't even know if we can believe them anymore. anymore. There is a lot going on in, this, in these moments in time. And so it is my honor to have these conversations with people because one of the things that I want this room to be is a room where my only objection, my only objective, my, my, I have a lot of objections to the way the world is going. My objective in this room is to love and accept the people that come in here, to listen to them and hear them and to acknowledge and validate them. Because it only takes a little slice of light to end some darkness. And I'm not saying that the world is dark and this is light, but it's so comforting for me and for people that come into this room to know that they're going to be listened to and heard. That there's not, they're not going to have to fight for their right to say what they want and defend them. And, and so anything goes in this room. It's really a beautiful place. And what I find often is who people are not falls away and who they are starts to emerge. And I think that's the most beautiful thing that anybody could ever do. It was brought on a little bit by the sponsor, my sponsor, which is the mosaic, the book over my left shoulder. The mosaic is a book I say I wrote, but I didn't really write it. I tried to write it for three years and I couldn't get, I couldn't get anywhere. And what happened is the characters in the, in the fable, it's a fable about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults where his parents are, they tell him they're in a place called heaven. So he sets out on a search for heaven. And the people he meets are not the standard light bearers that you would imagine. They're not the priests and the clergy and the medicine women and the holy, women, holy men and women of the world and the Aborigines elders. They're common, ordinary people. And he wonders, what am I sitting with this homeless man for, or this juice man, or this gardener, or this road worker, or this street artist? Why am I sitting with these people? But when he sits with them and listens to them, and he hears them tell them who they are, he realizes his perception of who they were is not at all who they are. And when that happens over and over and over and over with everybody he meets, he starts to wonder, do I see anything in the world the way it is, or is it always just the way I see the world the way I am? And what would happen if I slid myself to the left and got out of my way? What would the world look like if I could actually see it the way it is? It's a fabulous story. My sponsor would be very happy if you went to Amazon and got it. <laughs> I would be happy because it will change your perceptual identity of how you see the world. I think it's just in, in the innocence of a little story, sometimes everything in life changes. Now to my sponsor, I thank you and I say good night. <laughs> because we have a beautiful opportunity to welcome into the conversation, Jean Tien. Jean, welcome to our conversation today. Thanks, Danny, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I love that. Why are you excited to be here, just in general? Tell me. It's always, for me, I love having conversations with people I've never met, and you and I have never met before. We have friends, a friend in common, Marla. Um, but it's an opportunity to always learn from other people as well. And that for me is exciting. Um, you know, your day to day can get a little boring, especially if you're always around the same people talking about the same things. 
So when there is an opportunity to have an objective, non-judgmental conversation, it's always exciting. I love that. I love that. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you're doing in the world right now. Uh, three, sure. three big questions. Um, those are really big questions, so I will answer them as succinctly as possible, however, because I don't want to bore your listeners. So my name is Jean Tian. I am an intuitive mindset coach, and I work with women to help them truly lead their lives by making choices that they never thought was possible. So basically helping them realize the possibilities out of the impossible. And I started down this path maybe about three years ago when I first started on my own personal journey. And um, for me, I have always been this very by the book, you know, I'm raised I'm the first daughter of immigrant parents and always raised very like by the book, you have to do this, you have to do that. And everything has been defined for me in terms of next steps. And so next steps were great because I always had to get good grades to get to the good schools, to get to the Ivy League University, which I achieved, and then to get a good job after that, which I achieved. And then I was so lost because I didn't know what the next steps were. Actually, I did. You had to rise the corporate ladder. But I never knew how to do that. Nobody ever taught me how to do that, other than my parents saying, you have to be nice to everybody. But quite frankly, I I started out in finance. Being nice to everybody didn't exactly work out well in finance. Um, And so I was very lost. And I felt very, um, after a while, even when my career started really going upwards, um, because I found my own way of doing things, I still felt really lost because getting to that next level of being a partner or a managing director or very senior within the organizations of corporate felt empty to me. It felt very empty to me because the, 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 the hamster wheel of waking up and then running for the trains and then going to work and then being at the mercy of everybody that I work with. And they're all, you know, and for the most part, everybody's really nice, right? But it's still kind of the mundane over and over again and then coming home and eating dinner and whatever you're on and this is why it's nice to have these conversations with people that are outside of your normal and then so you know that got to me and i said this and i remember the days where my husband would be driving me to the train station and i I was so unhappy and i was like this just cannot be my life for the next 50 60 years like i cannot imagine myself doing this every day it does not motivate me And that's when I started out on my personal journey, looking for what was, um, what could potentially fill me up in terms of the void and the emptiness that I felt. And I found what I call spirituality. And spirituality to me is very much a personal development, personal journey, um, awakening the unconscious, basically. And through that, it just, my whole life has turned into something different. And it continues to evolve into something different which is what I love about it because every day as I'm reading, as I'm speaking to people such as yourself, Danny, and as I'm taking lessons and hiring coaches, I learn something different. And that to me is so powerful, so rewarding. Um, And so this is why I do what I do. Love it. There's so, first of all, thank you. And I want to bring the listener right in because as Jean said, we do not know each other at all and listen to how beautifully vulnerable and open and honest and real she was in sharing that. And so I want to just encourage you as I will over and over and over and over again as a listener to take time to reach out of the, of the little silo that you're in and sit with somebody you don't know, because look how easy it is to just be able to share with somebody who you actually are. I think all of us are yearning to just have those real conversations. Yeah. And to be heard, like you said, Danny, I think being heard is often what one secretly wants because you can say, but you're not being heard. Yes, yes. Love that. There's so much to unpack in what you said. So I just want to jump into it a little bit. Okay. Let's do it. (laughs) I I am sure there are people listening here. And they might be listening, waiting for their train to come to take them to that job that they don't know what they're going to do with for the rest of their life. 
but they're scared to death to go outside of that place. What gave you the courage to, you were working your way up into what the world deemed a successful life. Mm -hmm. What about that wasn't successful to you? And did you feel like some sort of oddball or weirdo or, you know, or why does this work for everybody and not for me? And Oh my gosh, yes. You hit it on the nail right there, Danny. Um, I was, I, you know, it's so funny you say that because I looked around, I've had literally up until, and I still do think this sometimes too, is that I have had in my corporate career and I've been in corporate for about 20 years or plus now. And I look at my Did you start career, at like five years old or what happened? That's so sweet, but no. <laughs> No, it's the uh, Asian genes that I uh, am truly grateful for in my life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, no, so I, I'm 43, you know, and so I have done a lot within that period of time. I've always been in corporate, always in finance since graduating. I did do a stint in law school, so I am technically a lawyer as well. Um, but when I looked around me and everybody just seemed so happy, everybody. They all had smiles on their face. They always like chatted and they all seemed to have friends and they all seemed to be able to manage these really tense relationships that I felt like, and I thought I was weird. I thought I was just not good enough or I thought I was the troublemaker because internally I felt so unhappy. I couldn't stand the injustice or the lack of integrity that I saw. Yeah. And I couldn't stand what was being directed at me. I couldn't stand like, you know, and I just had these expectations, quite frankly, when, especially since just joining um, the corporate force after like law school and also after, you know, graduating university, I had expectations of how I should have been treated or how it should have looked within the workforce or how, you know, like things should have been according to the Harvard case studies, right? right. Like right. everybody should be nice to each other and productivity and teamwork is the way to go. And I expected everybody to subscribe to that same to that same mentality. And when it came down to it, it wasn't like that. And that made me so unhappy. And I, and I complained and I, there are plenty of times I've cried in the office, which I know is the big taboo yeah. because I would get so angry about certain things. Right. And I am by nature, very sensitive. I always have been, and no matter how hard I try to hide my sensitive parts, right. And be that tough person and yeah. have thick skin. I mean, it's over 20 years and I still don't have thick skin. Yeah, thank right? God. <laughs> it's like, it's not something, because it's not me. I can't yeah. develop, I mean, I have thicker skin, but I don't have thick skin. Um, and so because I was so different, I thought I was literally just defective, defective. And I would have the worst managers. I literally, like, I always thought I had like the worst luck when it came to my jobs and to came to my managers because I, there was always something off, always something off. There were, let, let me just take a step back. There were a couple of really great ones, really great ones, but the majority of them, <clears throat> there was something off. And so I was like, so it came to a point where it's like, well, the common denominator is always me. Cause you know how people always look at what the common denominator, right? right? Well, the common denominator is always me. So I'm the problem, wow. I'm the problem. And to a certain effect, yeah, I am the problem because I had all these expectations. I had all these judgments. I had, I literally created the problems that I was experiencing yeah. um, because of the fact that I, I saw them as problems. So like to your point about how a change of perception or a change of view can literally shift somebody's life. I, I honestly saw that happen to myself within the last three years. Beautiful. Because I realized I was part of that problem too. Yeah. Um, so how would you even change that perspective if you had the opportunity right now to change that perspective? So one of the most powerful um, realizations that I've had, even just in this past year alone, was that what was happening to me was happening for me. Okay. And so everything that I experienced up to this point and I continue to experience, right? Um, and it happened for me so that I can be out there and, and be able to help other women who are experiencing the same exact things. And that's what I've seen repeatedly happen as I talk to people. 
And as so, I talk to my clients, yeah. And I appreciate that. And, and I don't want to lose that. And I think that's incredibly valuable, but I'm asking a slightly different question. Sure. When we don't fit in someplace, <clears throat> excuse me, when we don't, when the world seems happy and all the mirrors around us show us an unhappy world, we think that we, it's very natural and easy to assume, well, we're the problem, we're the thing that needs to be fixed, we're the thing that needs to be changed. What I'm asking is, can you see the possibility of a different perspective there? And I'm going to paint it out for you just to make it easy. Okay. That there really is no problem, that you're not the problem. The problem is you're in the wrong place. And that if you were to ask an elephant to climb a tree, like a monkey, the elephant would think he's the problem because he can't climb the tree. All the other monkeys are climbing the tree. But an elephant was never meant to climb the tree. An elephant, if he wants what's on the top of a tree, he takes his, he takes his trunk and pulls the tree out of the, root, out of the ground and takes it, takes it from the top. He doesn't need to climb up the tree. Right. And what I think the stories that we end up te telling ourselves, this is a long question to ask if you agree with it or not. The stories that we end up telling ourselves are that no, an elephant should be a monkey. We should be able to climb the tree like those people because mm -hmm. we've been taught that we are monkeys and we need to be monkeys in order to be happy. Yeah. But we're not the problem. They're not the problem. We're just not in the right place. It's, it's one of the reasons why I like the image of a mosaic more than a jigsaw puzzle. Because a jigsaw puzzle, we grow up thinking every piece has to go into its proper place. Right, that's great. But over the course of time with a mosaic, you can move those pieces around to many different places and it still looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because over the course of time, we evolve and we, be, we belong in different places. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, that perspective? That makes a lot of sense. And it makes, and I agree with you 100%. This just, you know what, it's not you or it's not me and it's not them. It's the system. And, and, and I'll say it this way in the sense that we are forced to, because it's just easier to fit into a certain system into a certain form into a certain mold so i don't necessarily think um and i think this is a little different than what you are asking but i i think that a lot of times we are expected to or even by ourselves to fit in and to fit in means like what you said the elephant would climb the tree right rather than to look within to say okay my strength is not climbing my strength is my trunk or you know my strength <laughs> technically right. for the elephant <laughs> oh. and it's to pull that out, down that branch and but so so often especially in it i think it starts with quite frankly i'll say it you know um and no disrespect to my parents or anything but it starts with the times when we were young because they weren't taught differently so they didn't yeah. know any better and so they raise us the same way right you have to fit in you have to fit into the system we have to get good grades and the only way to do well in life is to go and get that job in finance to go become a hotshot lawyer to become you know whatever it is right and so there is that system that was created and it's it's the individuals that have to be like pushed into the system like you said that jigsaw puzzle that fits in instead of um, instead of empowering the individuals, the system that works would more be, would to me, would seem more like one where it would empower individuals to actually look for what works for them and to be able to pursue that and be able to support that individual. So do you feel like your, um, I want to be careful because I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you're saying. So if I'm not saying the words right, tell me that I'm not saying okay. the words right. Yeah. Okay. But the sense of not fitting in that you felt in, in, your, in your firm that you were working in, mm -hmm. did your sense of not fitting in start at the firm or did it start way before that? Did it start in college? Did it start in high school? Did it start in, as, a, as a kid? Where do you think it started? It definitely, so I always, that's a really good question. I had actually never thought about that, nor had I really been asked that question. Um, I think it's a good question. I don't think I ever truly felt like I fit in anywhere, even prior to working in corporate. Yeah. 
And I always felt like, and, and, and the reason I'm stalling is because I don't know if I made myself feel like an outsider or if I, if, or, you know, if I felt like an outsider, but I definitely felt more often than not, I think for the majority of times, like an outsider, yeah. like I didn't belong. And I think there's a lot of insecurity and lack of confidence that went along with that as well. Yeah. Right, like, oh, how come I don't look like that? I don't act like that. I don't speak like that, or I don't think that way. Um, and so there was always, you know, and and actually, it's interesting because I always attributed it to an I um, an identity crisis because of my race, meaning I'm not Asian enough, but I'm not American enough. Right. So I never actually, to your point, I never really did feel in because I. Uh, fit in because I never felt if I were to go to Asia they would say no you're an outsider right if I'm here in the U.S. right which I am they look at me as an outsider just based off of my looks yeah so I can never really find that place yeah so do you think most people feel like they fit in or do you think most people feel like they're a little bit different I think people deep down recognize that they're different but I, I, I don't know if they allow themselves to feel it, experience it, or accept it. Yeah. Or if they, it, because I feel like then there brings a lot with it judgment. Because in this society that we live in, if you don't fit in, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. It's not yeah. you not fitting in means you're special. It means right. you're wrong in some way, right? Yeah. And I remember when Steve Jobs came out with his campaign for Apple and he said, this is for all the rebels. These are for all the people that don't fit in. And I thought, what a stupid campaign. Why would you do that? <laughs> Nobody's going to admit that. But look how big Apple's gotten, right? That's true. That is and, true. And I think what one of the biggest research, po- like the questions that I ask, in, in the, especially in the earlier parts of this conversations, I was gath- gathering data. And one of the data points that I was amazed at was I thought when I asked people, do you fit in or do you feel like you're a little bit different? People were going to say they fit in because everybody wants to fit in. Yeah. Uh, 95 plus percent of the people that have answered that question for me, and it might just be the algorithm of people that are drawn to the show or who comes on to the show, have told me, no, they've always felt different. And so one of the preconceived notions, one of the perceptual shifts is if we are part of a majority of people that feel different, then the judgment of being different would go away. Yeah. What would it be like for you if you realize that you, in your differentness, you are, you fit into a world that where everybody feels different. How would that change your perception of your life? I think it would be much more comforting to know I'm not the only one because I think in my human nature, and this is something that I'm working through every day as well, is this need for external validation. And that need for external validation would make me say, oh, thank goodness, I'm not the only one that doesn't fit in. Yeah. But what I'm working through is this need of of external validation, not necessarily being important. And it's not important. Yeah. And so it's in looking at it and saying, okay, regardless of what's going on around me and who's around me and what they are, I don't fit in and that's okay. I say weird things and that's okay. And let me not like replay it over. And this is what I used to do, replay over and over in my head for five days or five weeks and say, how could I say that? That was so stupid. What are they going to think of me? And, you know, like, this is why they don't like me, right? And so it goes into that and it goes into this, well, now it's like, okay, stop. It doesn't matter. I don't care. That's their problem. And it's not mine. Yeah. Um, So, so it's kind of like a long winded answer to say, yes, humanly, my first, my first reaction will be like, yes, like I'm not the only one. There is a group of misfits and it's amazing. And I still see it like it's amazing because this group of misfits is what creates change in this world. A thousand percent. Right. Um, But whether or not I fit into that group of misfits, then I don't want to continue to try to fit into that group of misfits because maybe I'm a different group of misfits or maybe I'm a different quality of misfits. Um, So so there's that dichotomy. 
I'm wondering if the listener hears what I'm hearing. And Jean, I'm just going to throw this over the net for, you to, for you to knock it out of the court or whatever we're going to, or hit it back to me, however you want to do okay. it. Um, it's so often easy to sit, and I'm sure you see this in the women you coach, to sit from the outside and look in and look at the world and the situations of things that are happening in a person's life yeah. and see all the signs that are helping them to get to where they're going. But when you're in that life itself, you don't really recognize them as easily. For a person who wanted external validation, you went to an Ivy League school, and am I to assume that it was Harvard because of the Harvard? No. Rules? Oh no. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, I went to Cornell. Cornell. Okay, so yes. Cornell's you know <laughs> as good as Harvard. So you went to Cornell. You got good grades. You went into a prestigious firm of some sort, I'm sure, because I'm sure that you went with a Cornell degree. You didn't go into a, you know, little messy nothing of a nothing. Um, well. Actually, I didn't, but we can talk about that later, okay. but yes. Nope, I didn't. Oh, you didn't go. Okay, so you went, but you got into some profession that gave, that yes. you rose up through. Yeah. To someone who would be looking from the outside, it would seem that you had gotten all the external gratification you could have gotten. You, could, you got all the external approval of who you were, was of being good enough, of being not only good enough, but being excellent. I mean, the caliber of person that goes to a Cornell is a handful of people in the whole, in an 8 billion person world. Um, it, to be accepted into one of those schools is, you know, amazing validation of who you are and how, and how intelligent you are and what they see in you as the potential to go forward. But the ex external validation of who people wanted you to be and who you were in their eyes still wasn't enough to give you the validation of going into the life that they thought was the right life for you to live or that they accepted as the right life to live. You chose a different place. Yeah. And so when did you realize that your internal validation was more important than your external validation or have you yet? It really is every morning when, when it was that period of time when every morning I would wake up and just feel miserable. The Sunday nights became miserable. And it then not only was it become, not only was it, you know, we always hear about the Sunday night blues. Mine became the Friday night blues. And that was just a miserable way to live, right? It's like Friday and Fridays are usually the best time because you have the full weekend ahead of you and you, you know, you have all these plans. But then the, my, the immediate thought then would be like, oh, but then there's only two more days left before uh -huh. I can go back to work. And so the impending thought of how, or the thought of going back to work on the Monday just ruined my entire weekend. It ruined it. And it just was not the way to live. It really was not the way to live. And I was so tired of, and you know, and I'm not saying, by no means am I sitting here and saying I'm perfectly healed and, you know, and don't care about, no, it's something as humans, we have, I mean, after having 43 years of caring, it's, you can't shut it down in a day, but it is. Something oh, you might be able to, you might be able maybe, to, you maybe, yes, but it's, but it's, I couldn't, it. right, I can't shut it down in a day. Yet. And then, so, you know, it's sitting there and just like constantly being miserable, worrying about, okay, what will my manager say? What will my manager do? What will what my parents was, say? What, what was say? your misery over? Like what, what, what was so terrible that Friday evening you would already say, oh God, in two days I've got to go back. What was it that was so painful for you? Yeah, it was honestly with work. It was always um, when I had those really challenging managers, it was always the managers. It was always the managers. And I don't know, it, it would be one manager to the other who quite honestly, there was a certain part I mean, it takes two people to create a problem, right? So I recognize my problem. But the other aspect of it also was that there was a lot of intimidation and insecurity and like maybe like diff and, and and discomfort with what I brought forth to the table. And so, for example, when I first joined my firm, my manager at that time didn't like the fact that I asked all these questions. 
But then I asked all these questions because I had gotten in trouble in the past because of not asking enough questions. And then so it is like, so everybody, so, you know, that being my first corporate job, I was like, well, I have to make sure I understand the, the, the project exactly as it is and blah, 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 blah. And, and to this day, I still believe, you know, it's important to ask the questions. But what I didn't recognize and I wasn't mature enough to recognize at the time was like the manager, because he was getting defensive because he didn't know it either. Gotcha. Because he didn't like being put on the spot either. And so he got so defensive and he would, you know, even start criticizing me for like, why do you have to ask so many questions? Why do you have to blah, blah, blah. And, and, and it was just like, because I was, you know, like, cause this is like the lesson that I learned from the last one. So anyway, so, um, so it was always that tension at work and always feeling like I was failing and always worrying if I was ever good enough and trying not to get, and like trying to stay under the radar, meaning like, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want tensions and I don't want, um, I don't want this tension at work. And it was that tension and that constant fear of being criticized and constant, like, um, getting into trouble that, and, and, you know, like failing in that aspect, right. That made me so hard on myself and made me like, just dread. It was like, it was literally, I dreaded going into work. Um, I even remember that first job, I developed insomnia because of it. Wow. Yeah. So you know how we asked the question of whether it started before college or started before or started in college? Let's ask that same question here. Yeah. Did, that, did that sense of wanting to please everybody, not feeling good enough, did that start in the workplace or did it start before then? Oh, it started before that. I know for a fact it started before then it started before then. Yeah. And can you, and again, you can say no to any of these questions. Okay. Um, I have no problem sharing. <laughs> okay. Can you identify where that started? Where that, yeah. where that. Absolutely. It started. Um, <laughs> so believe it or not, it started when I was a baby, quite honestly. Um, but that's in terms, and the reason I know that is because I've done the healing and I've done the energetic work to identify the root of that. But if we wanted to talk just pure human to human, um, the fact of it started when I was a child, right? Um, I was the firstborn, but I was always told that I'm too dark skinned or too fat or my grades aren't good enough. And how come I can't be like my tall, pretty a uh, fair skinned cousin who is so beautiful and, you know, and everyone around me would always make comments. And so it was, and I would hear it and I was never like, oh, you know, like great grades. It was always like, okay, you have to do more. You have to do more. You have to do more. Um, so it absolutely started at home. So when did you start believing that, that it, making it so that it, they, the voices that you heard outside you didn't even need to exist anymore because they were living so strongly inside you? I don't think you can, I, I don't think I can pinpoint it to be honest, because when you grew up in that environment, you literally just absorb that in as your truth, right? Because nobody is telling you otherwise that like, oh no, no, no that's not, that's not truth. That's just their insecurity. Nobody is saying that because the people that my parents surrounded with, they all thought the same too, because that's what they would say. Right. Um, my grandparents thought the same. Oh, you're so annoying because you cry too much. Oh, you're so annoying because you're so sensitive. And kids around me would say that. And so there was literally like no, no, nothing there that would ever tell me any different. So that was my truth. That was my reality at that time. Have you ever tested on IQ? Uh, I think the school did, but I don't think I came out all that positive. At least nobody ever said otherwise. <laughs> It's so interesting because I was just on a podcast recently that, um, and the woman said, when I read your life story, I just wanted to have you on the podcast because you have the story of a genius IQ. And she said, have you ever had your IQ tested? And I said, yeah, in fact, when I was, a, when I was like six years old they, or something, they tested my IQ and found that I was, you know, a genius level. Wow. And, and they moved me. They thought I was cheating in school because I knew the answers to the math questions without doing any of the work so they would give 20 questions and say we have an hour for this test 10 minutes later i'd hand my paper in 
And I'd say, I'm done. And they said, well, there's no work here. So the teacher took me to the principal's office and said, we're going to, and the principal said, we're going to expel you today, Danny. There's no way you could have known these questions, answers, and you don't have the work to show how you did it. I said, yeah, no, I don't know how I got there. I just know the answers. You just know, yeah. And so they said, we've called your mom and she's going to come. We're going to expel you. We have a no, we have no cheating, no tolerance on cheating. And I said, okay, but I didn't cheat. And they said, well, that's pretty hard for us to believe. I said, okay, so I'm six years old. And so I said to, I said to these adults, I said, why don't you give me 10 more questions that I don't know and put me in a room and lock me up and let's see what happens. But we got to wait for my mom to come anyway. So they gave me 10 more questions and they said, your mom will be here in 20 minutes. 10 minutes later, I knocked on the door. They said, are you willing to tell us who cheated? I said, no, I'm done with my work. <laughs> and they said, And they said, but you don't have any... Thing written here I said that we, we understand that I said are the answers correct or not and they brought my teacher in and she said these answers are spot on correct and I said so now how did I get that who did I cheat from to get that so they said we're so sorry and my mother came in and said what's going why are you expelling my child they said no it's our fault we he he outs he's he gave us proof that he didn't cheat and we just have to move him up two levels in, in wow. school wow but some of the things you're saying, the woman on the podcast, there's a group of people that have genius IQs. It doesn't necessarily mean they're smarter than anybody, yeah. but the way they relate to the world is from a genius point of view mm. is more, they're too much. They're too emotional. They're too, they think too much. They ask too many questions. A lot of your too many's put you in that realm of people that I would, I would be interested to see um, if, you had a way of, of accessing that. Um, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, because it made me feel so comfortable for all the things that I thought were just my um, inability to commit to things. My, right. I, I was just done with stuff. Um, do you think people in the world listen to each other? I think it's a small handful of people that actually truly listen to each other. Do you think people want to be heard? Ironically, yes. So if people want to be heard, why do you think they don't listen to other people? They're afraid of judgment. They're afraid of being wrong. And I don't know if there are always being vulnerable, talking about vulnerability again. I don't know if they're comfortable with being vulnerable enough to actually say what it is that they mean. I think so we that's, tiptoe around too much. So that's a little different though. I'm asking you, like, um, I understand that people may have problems speaking their truth, mm -hmm. but I'm not asking you about speaking their truth. I'm asking mm -hmm. you about listening to another person's point of view. Mm -hmm. because we all want to be heard. Like if we, if we have an opportunity, if I, I've watched in this room how hundreds of people have come in and they, they're so thankful for the opportunity or for someone to just to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And so I have a, a, an early belief system from what I've done, the work that I'm doing, the research that right. I'm, you know, that people really enjoy the process of being heard. Mm -hmm. Whether they say anything or not is their point of view, but I hear them for whatever they say. It's so easy to listen to another person. It's so easy to hold the space and just let people tell you what they believe. That yeah. doesn't take vulnerability. It doesn't take anything. It just it takes, it takes enough love and concern to actually care enough about another human being to say, hey, how are you? Why do you think we don't listen? I understand why we may not share our most vulnerable secrets, but why do you think we don't listen to another person? Like, look what's happening politically in the world right now. We don't listen. Neither side is listening to each other. Look what's happening in the medical profession. People don't listen to each other. Listen what's happening in the environment. We're not listening to the environment telling us something's going on. We haven't listen to what's happening in our bodies. We don't even listen to our bodies. Yeah. Why do you think we don't listen? I think there's a number of different reasons. And I think it's, especially when you say like listening to the body versus let's say listening to each other from a campaign perspective or political perspective. 
I think people listen and hear what they want to. I don't think they listen and hear what it is that it's the whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, but I think the question is slightly different in the sense of like whether or not people want to be heard and why they don't feel like they're being heard. Because if you're not speaking your truth, you're never going to be heard. So that's first and foremost. Now, why people don't listen and why people aren't hearing, like truly absorbing and understanding. So can, you, what can is I being pause said. you for a minute? I don't want to mm -hmm. lose what you first said. Will you remember what you're about to say now? And I, I hope so. I can't oh, promise. I hope all right, so. so say what you're going to say and then maybe I can come back. I don't know if I can remember, but go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. No, I was going to say, I think people don't um, hear and they don't process. Like they're, they're just so quick to, 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 to almost like it's, it's that validation. Right. And it's that like, no, 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 I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. And they, they may just not be in a place. And a lot of times people may not be in that place to be able to accept being wrong or to accept something different because that doesn't serve them well. So you have a sense that if I listen to you and you say something that disagrees with me, then I have to accept that I'm wrong. I think certain people would feel threatened by it because it would, especially, um, it just brings into the picture something so different that they never thought of before. Yeah. So maybe it, maybe it ungrounds them, right? Um, and maybe it's not something that they want to hear or that they're willing to hear or that they're in ready to hear at this time. So it's almost as if the story of talking to your manager and asking your manager questions and him not knowing the answer has recycled around here into this this place too because we yeah. people feel incapable un because they don't know the answers they're scared that if someone says something different that what they believe may be wrong and they don't want to challenge their own belief systems right and, and you know what and it's funny when you say that because i the first thing that popped into my mind is religion take a look at religion yeah right I mean, everywhere. It, 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 and those are some of those institutions that I'm talking about that are crumbling, yeah. right? Yeah. So this isn't meant to challenge, it's meant to understand, all right? Mm -hmm. I've had the experience in this room with multiple people. of them not speaking their truth, truth, but through questions that I ask them about their truth, tr untruth, truth, they've come to their truth pretty quickly. And so that sense of if we are not speaking our truth, then people can't hear our truth. I just want to like, I'm a very black and white person, look, black sweater, black glasses, white hair, black, <laughs> white, black, white wall, right? I, I, but the world doesn't exist in those black and whites that I create. Mm -hmm. And so for people who are listening, I just want to, I don't want to take away anything Jean said, but I also want to give my perspective on this. That Absolutely. Um, when you speak to someone who actually listens, and when you listen to someone who actually speaks, somehow, the, I don't know how the chemistry of it works or the biodynamics of it work, but it's almost as if, remember I said, like when people come into the room, everything there aren't, they aren't falls off and who they are emerges. Mm -hmm. It's almost like that's what happens in the dialogue also, that most people will start off saying all sorts of things, but when they feel that it's safe to actually get undress so to speak yep. and say what they actually believe they actually it emerges yep. I think we, you hit the nail on the head in terms of safety Danny first and foremost because when before we start the conversation you you said this was a safe sp space so you already automatically disarmed them and when you ask the questions like coaches do or mentors do or whatever you want to call them advisors do throughout multiple industries, whatever they're called, they ask the questions to help people get to their truth too. Yeah. And so for those two parts together and what you've created here in that podcast is powerful to be able to help people 
come out with their truth and to be able to be comfortable enough to share that. But, but and this is not meant to be disrespectful whatsoever. This isn't normal conversation either. This isn't us, you know, a, a bunch of women and catty women at that, right? Because not every woman is catty, but when you get together, there could be cattiness or judgments or, accept or whatever. People may not feel that comfort and people aren't interested in asking the questions because yeah. like you said, they're not listening and asking. So let me, let me, I, and I, you weren't disrespectful to me at all. I love that. I love that you asked that. And I love that you tell, state that. Um, I want to hit it back over the net to you if I can. Like okay. Playing, like we're playing <laughs> tennis. Okay. Sounds good. One of the things I've seen in my years on this earth, and I've been with some of the richest people in the world and some of the poorest people. Is there two kinds of people in general? People that are affected by what's happening around them and people that affect what's happening around them. And we've all seen it. We've walked into a room where someone comes into the room and ever, suddenly the whole room wants to be around them. And sometimes someone walks into a room and the whole room doesn't want to be around them. Or some, some, we see somebody who does has that effect and the minute they open their mouth, everybody runs away from them because they, they misunderstood it or th thought there was, was something they weren't. And we've also seen how um, pliable people are when they're in a room and somebody has energy and they just are affected by that energy. Yeah. Do you believe it's possible to be in a room full of catty women and to bring depth to their conversation? That is a great question. I, love I think it. there's, I think there's a certain level of depth, depth, not depth, depth. I think depth possible. too, probably, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a certain level of depth possible. Now, how deep you go, I think depends on multiple things, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and it also depends on most importantly, people's comfort level yeah. and whether or not their barriers are up or down. Yeah. Part of the reason I'm asking you this is because I have a stupid sort of ability. I don't know if it's stupid, it's not the right word, but I always, I thought everybody was able to do what I'm able to do, but I found out that I'm sort of a weirdo and most people can't do what I do but I feel something when I talk to people and mm -hmm. I feel, I feel what's possible for them. Is it okay if I say something personal to you? Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. I believe you're being asked to do more than you're doing. I believe you are, you have capability and potential to do way more than you're, than you believe you're capable of doing right now. I've watched myself over the course of my life, tell myself stories over and over again, that I actually believe the stories were facts, not stories. And those stories limited me in terms of what I was able to do or not able to do. I believe it's time for you to bury some of those stories Powerful. and to allow yourself to emerge from within the, from, from with the, those stories are wrapped around you and keeping you from being who you are. And I've seen it on a number of occasions in this conversation with no judgment. I love you to death and I love your honesty and I love your, but there's such a desire in your soul to be free of all those stories. Oh yeah. Definitely. Thank you for affirming that. No, you are spot on. And I don't know if you read energy or not, Danny, but yes. yes. Yeah, that, that is pretty much. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting that you're saying that because it is something that I am very much going through at this moment in terms of um, expansion. I have expanded a lot, even in the past few months. Yeah. And I'm in the process now and I feel it of what they call up leveling of 
my story, I'll call it that, and my energy. Um, and it's been, a, you know, for, for lack of a better word, it's been a challenging process. It is getting rid of the old stories that no longer serve um, me. It's in, and, and I'll say from past lives and in this present life as well, because we carry them through. And it's in getting over a lot of the fears as well that has um, kept me within a certain form of what expectations have created, right? Expectations, yeah. judgments, projections, whatever else you want to call it. Um, so no, you're spot on. Absolutely spot on. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, you know, I know you all have about 18 minutes, right? A little, for a little bit more, 15 minutes. Um, One of the beautiful formulas the mosaic has shown me is that our thoughts become our words. Our words tell our stories and our stories create our life. And if we want to change anything in our life, we change any one of those things and everything mm -hmm. will change. Yeah. And I just think um, you are your soul is calling to me in this moment saying, I'm so ready to have my thoughts, my words, my stories, my life change. Yeah, it is. I'm, it is ready. It is definitely ready. It is, uh, yeah, it, it is a con. <laughs> it's so funny because every good coach has a coach. I'll say it that way, or at least that's what yeah. I believe. Yeah. That's lots of them. I have lots of them. Yes. And because it's, it's what helps you, right? Like these kinds of conversations, bringing in, asking the questions and such. And so I was actually just talking to my coach on Friday and she was actually highlighting the same thing. Like, you know who you are and then something small goes and is against what you think. And then you fall into this whole trap of like, no, you're not. And then you go and build yourself up again and you go into, and then, so it, it is very much of the soul fighting the ego at this time in my yeah. life, which yeah. makes for very interesting uh, conversations. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's so natural, you know, it's not, you're not alone in that, that battle. Yeah. That, and um, one of the things that happens for me in this room is people show up as who they are and they let me see them as who they are because they yeah. trust me and they feel confident they feel safe and uh i think it's because i look like santa claus or something that they <laughs> that they feel okay um but we have a few minutes left and i want to thank you for being as honest and real as you've been Thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I, yeah. like I said, th these conversations, if I had more of these conversations in my life, I think things would be different. I think yeah. everybody is just much more of, um, and this is not a judgment, but I think everybody is so busy and everybody is so protective of themselves and their feelings and everything else because they've gotten to a comfortable level that these conversations don't happen enough. Yeah. That's people. Great. Um, from the place that we were just sitting at a few moments ago, mm -hmm. from the place where you acknowledge your soul is ready to be seen mm -hmm. and heard, I would love for you to take a couple minutes and from that place, Tell me and the people that are listening what you would like to say from that place of honesty, from that place of truth, without the stories binding yeah. you. So what I'll share and what's coming forward for me at this time or for the group is that it's time for us as humans to let down the barriers and to recognize who we are in this world and that we are all interconnected, whether it's to each other or to more importantly, Mother Earth. Without this recognition, without this acceptance, without this, um, I'll call it acceptance, the world as we know it will not survive. The world as we know it will not continue 
And in order for us to be able to truly thrive as in Mother Earth, because we are all components of Mother Earth. We are all components of energy. We're all components of this universe that for whatever reason we have been led to believe for so many years now, in so many centuries now that we're not able, that we are not, that we do not have this power within us. But the, the, the this, and, and what you wanna call scary, I think a lot of people consider it scary and I'm not sure, if, but it's time for us to recognize and step out of the scary and to accept it as our own truth is that we are powerful, not F-U-L, but powerful, F-U-L-L -L beings. And what we see today in our reality is not reality at all. Because what we consider reality is a solidification of, it's like a solidification of a belief, if that makes sense. Um, but reality is very malleable. It is very much a fluid thing. It is an evolution of who we are. And as such, reality is not a solidification unless we choose to make it a solidification. And as human beings, we are powerful that we can malle we can malleate, we can <laughs> mold, we can create our reality. But in doing so, we must give back to the earth. We must we must have communion with the earth. We must be able to accept that we are part of this earth, and that every part of this earth is a part of ourselves, and vice versa. And so, it is within this time that everything that we do is very much a contribution to everyone else around us, but more in terms of, I see it more as like an energy ball, and I can't describe it better than that, but an energy ball of what we've created as this earth that we know of as today, but yeah. more of it. And it's actually, it's interesting because I've never ever gotten this before, but this earth that we know of is just simply another energy ball and we happen to coexist with it. Yeah. Love it. Jean, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have all of your, you're going to send me all your social media, yes. all your websites, all that stuff. For people who want to have more dialogue with you, for people who want to work with you, for people who want to do all of that, what would be the one place they should go to? You'll, they'll, they can check you out on all the places, but what's the one place you always check? Yeah, the one place I always check is actually my Facebook group. It's a free Facebook group, and I'm always on there at least once a week or so to share, to have card polls, to answer questions, whether it's channeling or not. And so that is the place where I'm most active. And, I, and it's called the Leaders Lounge for Fempreneurs, because right now I work mostly with women mm. and step into their own power. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and yeah, and everyone is welcome. I cannot wait. I love these conversations. So if anybody just wants to have a conversation, I'm here Fabulous. and I'm ready to receive. Thank you again for being here. And I, I just want to take a moment and thank those who come here all the time and listen to these conversations. I, I'm so touched that you would give your time to listen to an imperfect stranger like myself, talk to other strangers in this room and to watch the beautiful transformations that happen in this room. I don't know if you could feel it, but did you see an energy shift in Jean as we kept going through this process? Did you feel it, Jean? Yeah. Yeah, there's an energy shift that happens. And I'm just so um, in honor of that and so grateful for that and have so much um, awe of that still no matter how many conversations I have. For those of you who are listening, I close every show with the same request. Take 10 minutes out of the course of your life. Find someone you don't know. Online, in person. And just ask them how they're doing. And just listen. You don't need to fix them. You don't need to help them. You don't need to change them. You don't need to uplift them. You don't need to convert them. You don't need to do anything. Just listen to them. Just love them. Just be with them. Just hold them in your, in your energetic orb of this earth that Jean spoke of. And hold them in that space and just let them feel safe and comfortable with you. 
when we live in a world where people are strangers, it's a strange world we live in. But when we live in a world where people are our friends, the world itself becomes a friendly world. And who wouldn't want to live in a friendlier world? We have the ability to make that happen within the world that we have. And when you do that in your world, and I do that in my world, and Jean does that in her world, and everybody listening does that in their world, guess what? We create a bigger world where that's what happens. Jean, is there anything you want to say before we head out? No, I thought that was beautiful. I agree. I Thank absolutely you. agree. Thank you. Again, thank you for being here, folks. Thank you for being here. Thanks Until for the next, me. yeah, my pleasure. Until the next stranger works their way into this room, um, be kind to each other, be loving, hold space for each other. Know that we are one big energetic orb, and all of us together make up that orb. So, respect each other and give each other the space to play in your orb with peace. Until later, ciao.